go over one question from the quiz that a lot of people have trouble with. Uh, I think it's the last one. Um, which of these does Kant believe? And the answer is B, none of the above. So what's wrong with A? What's wrong with B? What's wrong with C? What's wrong with A? An action is good only if we have a contrary to our conventions. So Kant has no problem at all, no problem at all, saying that somebody could act from duty and also happens to have an inclination to do that same thing. His examples are usually cases where somebody acts from duty and has a contrary inclination. And he likes to give that kind of example where somebody uh, is miserable with their life and is contemplating suicide but recognizes that duty requires them to continue. He gives that kind of example in order to bring out the contrast between acting from inclination and acting from duty. But he has no problem, I mean, on the contrary. He thinks it's a great thing if, in addition to acting from duty, that will also satisfy your inclinations. Right? So that, in addition to acting from duty, you're happy. That's even better than acting from duty and being unhappy. Okay, so one is not correct. An action is good whenever it means a good outcome. Um, he doesn't think that. Um, so the shopkeeper is supposed to be an example of this. And the shopkeeper who is um, um, uh, acting simply out of self-interest charges a fair price. But that's not enough to, for us to say that the um, person has done a moral, it, it, the person is morally virtuous. So you can't judge uh, based simply on the role of the uh, And C, um, whenever it's done for its own sake. So, so C, C um, we're supposed to see a contrast between um, two ways in which somebody could do something for its own sake. For example, if the person has an immediate inclination to do it, and if the person recognizes that duty requires it. And both of those are cases where an action is done for its own sake, but uh, the action is taken to be valuable for different reasons. Because it satisfies inclination or because that's what duty requires. Okay, so the answer here was not. Anybody. anybody have questions about these? Um, I feel like B is still an accurate answer. Like, this would be the best answer because you're saying good, not like the most praiseworthy or... So, right, so the action is good, you're saying. Yeah. So. So if you read that as the sort of outward manifestation whenever it aims at a good outcome. Yeah, so because so, B so, is so it really should be morally good here. Right? Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. <coughs> okay, we wound up last night. Anything else about that question? We wound up last time looking at the second proposition, and I wound up talking about these three uh, examples from um, the introduction. So, sorry, this is the editor's introduction. So I want to go over these again. I don't think I was clear. So let me first of all say that these three examples here uh, are not cons. They are the editor's. And what they're supposed to show is that a maxim, so we have three maxims here, and what these are supposed to show is that what makes a maxim good is not simply that the incentive is good, the reason for the action is good, and it's also not simply that the action, what is being aimed at, is good either. But somehow, what makes a maxim a good one is the combination of the two. Neither the incentive nor the action alone is enough to determine whether a maxim is good. So the thought here is that 
again, this is supposed to be intuitively we all agree that acting on the first maxim would be okay. That maxim is all right. Uh, acting on the third maxim is okay. Acting on the second maxim is not okay. So um, this is where we're supposed to start. But notice one and two. One is an okay maxim. Two is not. But notice that one and two have the same incentive. And notice that the incentive here, the, the reason for doing the action in question, um, is satisfying my inclination. So a couple points here. First of all, uh, the first one is supposed to be, first maxim is supposed to be a perfectly permissible maxim, perfectly okay to satisfy your inclinations by doing what I want. In this case, when the means are mine. So when something is uh, my property, my weapon, I'm going to do something with it, I'm entitled to do that because it's mine, I'm entitled to satisfy my inclinations using my stuff. So one intuitively is okay. Notice that two here, the incentive is the same. I want something, I want to satisfy my inclinations. But notice that here now the means by which I'm satisfying, I'm proposing to satisfy my inclination, namely using your weapon, this is, this is not going to be permissible. I'm, I would be satisfying my inclination using means that I'm not entitled to because it's yours. Okay. So one more time, the difference between one and two is that the incentive of satisfying one's inclinations is the same. But the means by which we're satisfying it are different and that makes uh, uh, one permissible and two impermissible. Okay, what about two and three? Two and three, we are supposed to see that the action itself is the same, but the incentive to doing so is different. So, two, I'm going to keep your weapon because I have an uh, inclination to do so. That's not okay. But Keeping your weapon because you may hurt somebody with it. Well, I'm mad and may hurt somebody with it. Well, that's supposed to be a good reason to do that. So here, uh, the thought is supposed to be, um, even though I would be using something that belongs to you, I'm not just doing it because I feel like it. I'm doing it because I have good moral reasons. So maybe you want to question whether this maxim is in fact okay, um, but for our purpose, we're, we're supposed to concede that it is okay to keep something that belongs to somebody else when we're serving an important moral purpose. Okay, and so all of this was supposed to illustrate, as I say, the second proposition that. Um, it's not the um, purpose alone that determines whether an action uh, is done from the um, The last point about this, um, I'll, I'll say what these uh, examples are supposed to illustrate again, namely that um, it's neither the action itself, nor the incentive itself, that determines whether a maxim is good, but the combination of the two. So uh, an action from duty has its moral worth not in the purpose that's to be attained by it, but in the maxim. But notice what I want to emphasize to you is that the maxim includes the purpose. So Kant is not saying that the goal or the purpose is irrelevant. He's saying it's not the only thing. The goal and the purpose matters. It's part of the maxim. But the incentive matters also. 
and we can assess whether a maxim is a good one only by including both of those parts. Is that clear? Okay, on to the third proposition. That duty is the necessity of an, act, of an action from respect for law. This is on 16. And all I really want to say at this point is um, Law here, of course, means something like moral law, right? not civil law, not what the legislature in a country has passed. Um, duty is necessity of an action from respect for law. Look further down, right above 401. Um, he says, now an action from duty is to separate off entirely the influence of inclination, and with it, every object of the will. Um, uh, thus, he says, let me say that again. Now, an action from duty, so this is an action from duty that's morally praiseworthy, that a good will is acting on, that has a good maxim. Now, an action from duty is to separate off entirely the influence of inclination, and with it every object of the will. Thus nothing remains for the will that could determine it except objectively the law. Um, so duty somehow is not supposed to be dependent on the influence of inclination. Somehow an assessment of whether a maxim is a good one is not be determined by whether we happen to like it. And so all that remains for the will that could determine it is just the law. So we'll have to come back to see, figure out if we can uh, understand what that means. Thus, at 401. Remains. Once we take away inclinations, somehow nothing remains to determine a good will except the law. That was right above 401. And then at 401, he says, Thus the moral worth of the action does not lie in the effect that is expected from it, nor therefore in any principle of action that needs to borrow its motivating grounds from this. Uh, from this <coughs> Um, so a good will is not simply good because, um, because it wills the correct end. So it wills the correct ends for the right reasons, as I've been saying. Um, and so only then, when a good will wills the correct ends for the right reasons, based on the proper maxim, is it a good will? So I want to say that again. So a good will is not made good simply by aiming at the proper ends. It's made good by acting on proper maxims, which are a combination of aiming at good ends for the right reasons. So we have to be careful here, again, because whenever we will, we will an end. So there's always, an, as he says sometimes, an effect to be expected from it. So we always take that goal of our willing, that object of our willing, that end, to be good. Somehow worth pursuing. But this end, of course, 